Yo, what's going on? This is Funk Case from Circus Records. Welcome to my hometown of Bournemouth. Yeah, so this is a this is a track I did um, as a remix for the McMash Clan on Circus Records called Requiem. Um, the original was uh, a pretty good technical drummer bass release um, they did and. Uh, they drafted me in to do a drum and bass remix because I've, I've been loving making drum and bass recently. So, um, yeah, I just put my spin on what I think it should be and it was kind of like a jump up um, hybrid mix with a sort of technical sound and I, I couldn't really pinpoint what the sound is as such, but um, yeah, it's just, that was, it, was fun, it was fun to make and uh, yeah. So I got the stems in and my, my mostly, every time I work with uh, a remix, I'll do um, the intro first. Weirdly enough, that's the most fun part when you're doing um, remixes, personally for myself. So um, it's a mishmash on my on my <laughs> on my Cubase. I, I should have probably arranged this into a better uh, collection. But basically, I wanted to. The most fun with rearranging um, stems is that you can make your own version of the intro that you that you had instead of you know remaking it and then you're losing the original sound of the of the track. Uh, what I should probably mention is I should probably big up Rob Swire from Pendulum because the intro is very heavily. Um, influenced by a track called Masochist by Pendulum actually from back in the day. So uh, I wanted to bring it in with a bit of tribal drums. Just to fill it in, just to give you a sense of may maybe almost set the atmosphere with the start of these drums right now. So as those drums come in, as those drums come in, that's obviously very masochist from Pendulum, so I haven't completely ripped them off, but <laughs> it's been many years since that's been released, so I feel like I'm allowed to do that. Um, and yeah, basically, so I just, uh, that's all just arranged as it is, all the claps separately. Like. Yeah, so <clears throat> I have a feeling these are probably the stems they sent me. If not, they're from a sample pack and been bounced out. But uh, basically, I brought these in using a DJM filter by Xfer, which is a free, a free thing. And I'm pretty sure by the name of it, it's um, it's a version of the the filter you get on DJM mixers. Uh, I'm assuming, hence the name. So uh, it's a very simple low pass, high pass. It would be also known as a BP uh, um, filter. So I basically got the resonation halfway through, just so that you can hear a lot of the low rumble when it comes in. So because as you turn that off, you lose a lot of the, like the harmonics from the lows. So I brought that up just to give it in. And then, yeah, just automated that. So it just goes up very slowly and, and passes out. And it just ends like that with the, with the resonation and then cuts off. Uh, and as these are going through, the drums are obviously going through too. Um, that's a combination of using Effectrix, which I love the tonal delay on. Um, Effectrix by Sugar Bites, by the way, if you, if you didn't know that. So that's that's just a, a preset I think I edited and made the tonal delay a lot longer called Tokyo Morning. Um, I just like the way it ran through and did the drums basically. So it's a short loop. Um, yeah, Effectrix, very, very simple, very easy way of just having stuff done to whatever sample you want. You can do it on basses too, it will chop them to all this crazy stuff. Uh, it's worth checking out. That's actually a loop from uh, Simon Baseline Smith. Um, his, um, I think it's a Loop Masters uh, thing he did. That's a Technique, technique Recordings um, sample pack. Just a simple riff. Just looped over twice. But, uh, yeah, so I just, my EQing here was just to remove all the sub rumble from that, boost a lot of the, where the, between where the kick and the snare is, because um, that's a lot of where the harmonics are, and that's what I wanted to bring out a little bit more into these drums. So as you can see there on this analyzer here, there's a little bit of sub rumble, so I wanted to remove that, as there's a lot of sub rumble from uh, some of the orchestrals underneath and the, and the tribal drums. I've got a very gentle um, high mid boost here at about 5,000 um, hertz, which is with a good spread on it, so it sort of covers all bases on the, and that's only a 1 dB uh, boost. So. 
And as you can see, it just makes it nicer. And then I've got this other thing here called uh, X for X Dimension Expander. So I wanted that to go from the original mono-ish stereo sort of sound mid and spread out as it goes out. So I've automated that to do this. And as you, as you see here, that will automate dry wet, which I've got a certain size on it, which basically just goes and just spreads the hell out of it into the stereo, stereo image. So that's basically just, you know, just a little OCD thing I have in my... So that was for the second loop there. Just automated that in. Just to, just to give it a wide, a wide effect. It's just one of those little uh, things you just do as you're doing effects and, and edits and automations for the end of your track. Um, no real reason, it just sounds cool. <laughs> so, yeah. Same thing with these drums here, as I brought these in. A little bit more done to these. So my thought process on that, I first of all wanted to put the first layer on to spread it very naturally. Uh, oh, Cubase Stereo Enhancer, sorry. Um, is really good. It's a very amazing natural sounding spreader because there's a lot of um, spreaders these days which will um, do a very extreme Haas effect um, and will spread it to the sides but you'll lose the original mono which is a very important um, thing. You need to keep all your monos for because mainly probably about 70 to 80 percent of um, clubs work in mono um, on their mixes or on their on their outboard uh, mixes so Always keep your monos. If you lose the mono and it phases, you'll never get the right sound when you play it live. So it's got to be sound pretty much exactly as you hear it on mono, as you would on the stereo. <coughs> stereo Enhancer is a great example of how to naturally spread it without losing the mono. It's not too extreme. If you want to go pro more extreme, I'd probably say use Dimension Expander with Stereo Enhancer. Um, and I've merged that with um, uh, R-Verb on Waves. Um, very simple if you know how to use it. It's just a lot of size and time and diffusion and wet and dry. I don't really touch anything else apart from the EQ. Um, I've made sure a lot of the rumble from the from the EQ or the reverb was taken out of it because um, I don't really want. I didn't really want the the rumble to go and spread out through the um, atmosphere of it. I wanted the, mainly the mids, low mids coming through that. Otherwise, you'll be hearing the snare, the the main low snare hitting it. So I basically just wanted that in, and then, yeah, just I like Hall 2 as a reverb. Um. And then I've <laughs> I, get, oh, I, don't, I don't actually know why I did that, but yeah, I'll see if I can work out what to say. The reason was, was I was trying to remove all of the low rumble up to about 80 hertz, and then I think it was missing. So I've done a very <laughs> intense 12 dB boost at the bottom. And you can just about hear it, like that doo -doo 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 underneath. And I think I like the warmth. Um, if I'm going to do anything this thin with the Q, just to make it like that, so obviously the Q is two things. It's the thinner the Q and the wider the Q, which is the range of the EQ. So I had a thin EQ. I obviously wanted just the harmonic of that, of that low. Tends to just flatten the, the range a bit on the whole uh, analyzer itself. This brings it all kind of together. So, and it's the same thing here. I've done a, a two dB boost on the main snare low hit. Um, actually, one of my techniques of uh, finding out where the main hit of the low snare is is something Crystal Clear told me years ago. Was uh, basically just boost the cue really thin like that. That probably sounds horrible on your on your sound thing, but on uh, Fabfilter you can do this amazing thing where you can listen to the range that you've got just in this cue here. So I'll bo I boost that up to the top and just. You can hear musically. That's the note. That's the exact hit of the snare. So that's where the low hit of the snare will be. So I'll basically just play around with the, how much I want that to sound. Because obviously you can hear it's too ringy when you when you push it up too far. So I just gave it a, a cheeky 3D boost. So just play around with that <coughs> until it sounds good. Still sounds a bit ringy, just play around. There you go, sounds a bit more natural. You're just giving that a, a nice harmonic boost, um, which just, you know, it's not really affecting much else sonically in the track, especially not at this point in the track as well. Um, so yeah, I just wanted that to come through. Bit more of a hit. These days it's all about 
penetrating snares and kicks. So um, that's one really good way of boosting that, which we'll find out obviously later. And again, I've spread it twice over because it wasn't wide enough. So as you can hear, pre-reverb, that's pretty much a completely mono sound. So I've done a pre-stereo enhance, which does a little bit. You do the reverb and then I've, done a, I've enhanced the reverb itself in this one. And that's what this color thing does here. That basically is spreading it says colour, but it's actually spreading um, a certain amount of frequency. So the, uh, if you have it on zero, just down here, that'll be spreading the whole the whole frequency range. If you move it up, you'll start. Rem it's almost like um, almost like high passing it. You're removing the sub, and then the kick, and then the snare. So the more you do it, so that's actually only spreading the very tops as you do it 100. So you can just imagine like sub, kick, snare. So I've had it around 31, so around the snare. So basically just spreading that width of that part of, of the frequency of, of the reverb. Um, yeah, just again, just a nice effect. I think I've done exactly the same thing with, with this one. Pretty much the exact same thing. Only boosted the harmonics of what I want um, to come through from the track, as opposed to just doing a full range boost, because that's a pretty lazy way of doing things, to be honest. Um, so as again, I've listened to, probably listened to the the musical harmonics of, of the instrument itself. As you can see here, in these peaks, <clears throat> you can always find these peaks. Um, this thing on FabFoot has a, uh, a pre and a post um, EQ thing, so you can see what it was originally. Which is the, the, um, the lighter colour here, and as it goes darker, that's what you've added, so you can see what it's done. So right there, those peaks. That's the exact um, things I've boosted in the harmonics, basically. Um, and it just brings out a nice tone. You can just hear it there, that nice harmonic. So you can hear. It's almost like a chord. In itself, if you played if you played all three of those together, it would sound like a chord. But that's that's harmonically the best things to boost if you want to just bring out those little penetrating um, parts of the snare and bring a nice ring to it. Just puts a really nice ring into it. Um, I've got rid of a lot of the tops. Um, I think generally when I when I turn it up, I can hear a lot more of how much um, the tops are penetrating in the track. So obviously, if you don't remove certain frequencies from as they play each other, if you're not removing a lot of the tops, all the tops will play together and double up and triple up and it will sound more toppy than it should be. So um, you've always got to account for the amount of tops you do. And I like doing a lot of 12K to 14K roll-offs just down at the end here. So uh, yeah, you'll see a lot of that as I go through. So after eight bars, I thought I'd just start building up a little bit into where I was going to bring in the atmospheric drop into you know the main part of the intro. So. So I brought these snares in right here. Basically, the original snare, if I turn these off, is nice. But at the moment, it kind of sounds like it's in a, a weird sort of, I like to call it an image limbo. So basically, um, you can hear that it's very spread. But it doesn't sound like it would fit in a track on its own. It kind of sounds like everything has to sound um, together as a track. Um, stereo image is, is very important these days. It's, very, it's a very modern way of, of producing because it's really good sonically to, to fit everything in. But the problem is, is that sometimes you'll spread it too far and it'll almost sound like it's out of the mix. Almost, if, if you think about the atmosphere of a mix, you'll have the mono in the middle and then the stereo on the sides. But there's only so far you can go. And as soon as you spread it too far, it sounds like it's, it's hitting at all angles and it kind of sound, sounds very out of the track. It's, it's very disconnected from the track, if that makes sense. So you have to try and tame that. Um, so basically I use sound, sound shift to pitch stereo from Waves again, that's a, a good way of taming it. So yeah, I didn't like the, the original tone or the note of what the, the snare hit on, so I basically had to match it to the, um, the key of the, of the track, um, which is also a very good way of making a snare fit a track better. If you think, if you're trying to put a snare into a track and it's not penetrating hard enough into the track, it's probably out of key with the track. 
So um, your best way is to work out what the key is on the keyboard, play that, and then try and listen to see if your snare matches that um, on the low hit or anything else like that. And then uh, it will probably fit in better. Sonically, it will, it will penetrate better when you start playing with it. So I did that. That's what this first sound shifter is for. So that exact note is what fits into the track. Um, madness method. <laughs> Once again, this is my, my lazy way of doing things because I didn't think I needed to concentrate too much on this one. It's just, in it. it's just a build up um, snare. So I basically just boosted the tops by 11 dB because it was very flat originally. So as you can see over this, it's not, it's not too extreme um, going from the original to the other one, even though it's 11 dB boost. And I've basically done a, a wide spread on that um, with the Q, just to bring up the... Uh, the re it's quite... The original penetration of the low hit is actually very, very thin, as you can see there. So if I was to do a thin Q of that, it would probably sound a bit weird and ringy. So I wanted to just basically make it more of a natural EQ, just spread it out and bring everything around it up. Um, same with this here. As you listen to all of it, you can just hear there's a bit of a, like a, a lower, a lower penetrating hit to that. So I wanted to bring that up as well. So I just gave that a one and a half dB boost, and this one was a four dB boost. There's no right or wrong way to boost it, as long as it doesn't sound terrible, like that. You can clearly hear it's distorting itself. So around about there, sounds natural. Yeah, and that's all that is for. Same with the reverb again. I've, uh, um, I've removed actually the very tops of the snare um, because I don't, I don't want to reverb that for whatever reason, you know, whatever fits with the track, you want to do it. Um, but I've left a lot of the low hits in because the low hit is going to be around, I think it's two, 250 hertz or something like that. Yeah, 280, uh, was that two, yeah, so it's about 260 is the main penetration. So I've probably rolled this down 150 onwards. Yeah, so basically the low, the, the hit of the, of the snare is what I want to reverb. Because as you, as you remove the low of it, you'll just only really get the mid reverb and that's not what you want, you want the whole thing. As you can see, it removes it. So I wanted to get the whole thing in, just for just an atmospheric purpose, really. And then uh, I wanted to just build it up. Again, sound shifter again. The first one was obviously doing the original note of the track, so I wanted to automate from the original note, just bring it up, just be part of the build up, really. It's just a little, little OCD moment, I guess, what you want to call it. Very simple. And as you can see, that goes from the original value up until the 12 semitones up, which is an octave, um, and stays in key with the track, so it sounds very natural within it. <coughs> I've also got an automation on the, I think it's the wet dry. Oh yeah. So basically, to go as a, as a transition from it doing just a dut, 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 I've made it so that it goes from pretty much dry to all the way wet, which, um, it will remove the transient, which is the main the main slap of the snare. It will remove that and just like fit into it and just be all reverb, no no hit, which is you know just a, another way of um, creating an effect um, within the track to make it transition from this into the main bit we'll get into later. So as you'll see, the time and the wet and dry. As I raise those, the time obviously is the length of the, of the reverb, so I want that to just go for as long as possible as for you know for atmospheric purposes and the wet and dry the wetter it is the, the less you'll hear the hit of it and the more it'll fit into just being just reverb so yeah just a simple trick and you can hear it's in key with the track as well so uh, yeah it sounds very natural in the track I've been a drummer all my life um, pretty much since I was well I say 14 is not really all my life but it's the first instrument I ever learned um, Ever since I dis decided I liked music, um, 14 pretty much was the age I started to think about seriously about music, in a sense of playing instruments or listening, get, you know, getting into bands very specifically rather than just listening to anything I liked. Um, and I've been playing all my life, so I've been, in pretty much every track I've made since mm, I'd say 2013, I've always played my drums in it live. <coughs> so I've made a very messy, not very quantized uh, tom pattern. Um, just to go underneath uh, everything, just to fit with the tribal drums itself. I 
I wanted an offbeat tom hit tom uh, pattern, just so it doesn't just it just doesn't sound. It needs to sound live, doesn't it? So y you want things to kind of hit out a bit out and sound a bit more live. Because tribal drums, you're not going to have a guy on tribal drums hitting exactly on the beat. No one is exact. Not there's no drummer in the world who will hit exactly on a click. He'll hit it just off, you know, all that sort of stuff. So to keep that live effect, you don't really want to snap all the hit points on this. And then, uh, as you because as you can see. Cubase has this function on it called uh, hit points, where it will find every hit of the thing, and you can separate them by doing that, uh, going into that. Yeah, so you go into audio, and then you go into hit points, and you can do this thing called create, I think it's divide audio events at hit points. Yeah, so divide audio events at hit points, and that will get every hit of the tom, and then if you wanted to make it sound exactly on the beat, which for me doesn't sound very natural, it sounds too, too formulated, like a you know like it like it sounds like it's been made on a computer. So to get that live element, I didn't do that. But you can do that, and then you can just you know get every every tom and put it exactly on the beat and make it sound you know a lot more accurate. Myself personally, I don't like to do that. So I basically just chopped up my favourite parts of the of the whole thing I've done. I've probably done like a, a one minute riff, or I've done all all sorts of rolls and stuff. So basically, my me again, method for madness <laughs> is uh, removing all, basically all the low rumble, but keeping the main lows from all the, all the toms. So it's around 70, 60 uh, on the range there. So that's all hitting fine. I don't really want to touch with that. It was a bit muddy around here. I wanted these to be a bit more accurate. I didn't want anything penetrating more than anything else. Um, again, that can be personal preference. I actually played these on electric drums. I have a, a Roland TDX kit at home or something like that. It's a mesh kit, really nice. Um, I played it on that, so it's all they're all presets from drum presets from inside the, the brain of that of that drum kit. Um, which are all very flat actually. They're not I don't think they're very EQ'd, apart from maybe some of the cymbals, some of the snares, but these toms alone are very flat. So you can hear all the rumble comes back in. You just want to make it a bit more, a bit more bright, <coughs> clean them up a little bit from the mud, make them a bit more present, uh, boost the mids a bit. As you can hear the difference there. A bit, bit more of the rings from where you know the hits are and stuff. So, and again, remove all the tops because toms aren't supposed to be in any way. So just to, you know, just to clean that up a little bit, make them sound a bit more better, natural, more better, English. Shouts to Carnage. So, um, since maybe two, three years ago, I started speaking to uh, an artist called Joker, who's extremely hardware inclined. Um, and he is <laughs> a pretty main reason why I have all of this stuff surrounding me, actually. Um, Shouts to Joker. You've uh, killed my wallet. Thank you very much. Um, I have the Roland Juno DI. Um, for you hardware nutters out there who are saying it's not not as good as the original, I don't really care. It sounds great, <laughs> and it and you know it suits me good. Um, so there's a preset on here, one of the synths. I actually don't know which one it is. Yes, that one. So there's a preset on here called Porter Porter Lead One. It's the first. <laughs> it's the first. Um, preset on this on this keyboard actually. Basically just played a note just to give it a spacey feeling. Um, sounds like this. I suck at keyboards so I've had to quantize myself. There's actually a little clip in there but you can't hear it when the reverb's on. So uh, yeah I'm sorry to everyone for that. <laughs> so I've put a limiter on this basically just to uh, just to tame any clipping in it or you know any any peaks from when I play it because obviously when you first hit it there'll be an initial dun, 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 when you press it. So I wanted to tame the original, let's say, transient. I don't know if you would call it transient. Um, the first, the original hit of the keyboard. So basically, I've got a prick limiter on there just to tame the tops of it, the clipping. And then again, same thing with the reverb. To give it that original spacey effect, I basically just uh, put all the wet all fully up the time is nearly all the way up, and uh, same with the diffusion. It's all completely, you know, up as far as it will go, just to give it that nice effect. Very simple. 
Works very well with the tree. And then... As you can see, I've EQ'd um, the track, you know, just to get rid of any rumble in there, if there is any. I'll just do this. I'll just do this, actually, as an OCD thing, just to remove any rumble from anything. If, if there is or not, I don't know. Sometimes I'll just do it. I've actually got a preset on here, a default preset, which chops up to about 100 hertz, just for my own, you know, time. You know, just gives me a bit more time. I don't have to just go, you know, click it and then move it across. I think it just does it. Um, so, you know, it gives everything that cleanness from the rumble. Um, and then I've automated the middle ring here because I wanted it to open up, essentially, in, in the mids so that it comes out better when it goes into the next one. So I open it up. Instead of spending all my time trying to work out how to do it on that thing, I just did it quickly on, on the EQ, and you can. it's a really good way to um, do that sort of stuff. And it's just a, a two to three dB boost on the on the high mids there, um, just to you know just bring it out a little bit more. Nothing nothing too crazy. So one of my favourite production tricks um, is to use a lot of cinematics. Um, one of my favourite things to do. I don't know if I actually did this in one of my previous videos. Was, uh, I put a cinematic boom into it. For all you fans out there, yes, it's vengeance. Yep, it's a vengeance noise. <laughs> Um, Vengeance, the, the classic sample pack that the whole world knows about and can point out from one one sample they hear from Vengeance, they'll go, oh, that's Vengeance. Um, yeah, just nothing. I didn't want anything too crazy. I didn't want to get a kick and leave a bit and do all that crazy stuff. I just wanted to get it, you know, get it done. So as you can see, I've just done a cheeky little boost here on the main rumble of the uh, of the thing. I don't really want to remove the rumble off of, of this one because I want the rumble, essentially. <coughs> So I've just done a, a one and a half dB boost around here on the uh, main main rumble there, and I wanted to remove a lot of the ringing from this noise here. As you can see, it's a bit unclean. So it just cleans it up a little bit around this area, and then tried to give it a bit more clarity. As you can see, it just adds a, a nice bit of hiss to the end of it. <coughs> And there's a bit, a bit of mud in there, I must, I, I think I heard. Yeah. Just clean it up a little bit, just about 1 dB, nothing too crazy. Just little things you, you tend to pick up with your ears. You want it, you know what you want it to sound like in, in your head, pretty much, when you do it, so just, um, just do it accordingly, basically. Layered that with a kick as well. <coughs> so the original uh, stems I got, say of this choir coming in is already pre-filtered um, so I didn't need to do anything to that. The Mash Clan did a really good job on the uh, on the musical uh, factor of this track actually really really good. Um, so I didn't really need to do much I just wanted to accompany the original uh, stems so I did an undertone if you can just hear that. So that's basically just, uh, I think I bounced this out from, from what I did originally just to save um, CPU because uh, mine goes a bit crazy. I'm only running 32 bit. Um, again, it will be uh, probably this, probably this keyboard, um, low pass. Just to accompany that. And as you can hear, it just warms up the whole thing. Makes it sound a bit nicer. Uh, nothing too crazy, just a, a cheeky boost. Uh, basically, yeah, that's how that is. So you just got rid of all the all the mid tones out of that, just to give it that nice warm harmonic. Nice warm harmonic into that. So this section sets the tone a bit for what's about to happen into the track. It's always good to have a... Build-ups are a very obvious thing these days. Um, so you really want to try and set an atmosphere. I'm very, I'm very uh, fond of doing atmospheres in tracks these days. Um, 
you know, it's just it's it's all part of music. Like when you listen to an orchestral, it's always about the atmosphere. So you want to build yourself up for the main drop. In obviously in electronic music, it's done in many different ways. You can do it with orchestrals. You can just do one really long build up. You can do um, just anything really. Obviously, there's a million ways you can do an intro. But I myself like I like doing uh, atmospheric ones. So it's all about setting the tone. So I basically found this sample. Basically found this sample on the internet, um, probably from a trailer from a film uh, or something. Just me, uh, just once again, set the tone. It's, it's all about annihilation with the track. Um, the original didn't uh, say anything about that, but um, this was probably the first track I'd put out in a while. So I kind of wanted everyone to go, oh, Jesus, okay, fair enough. So I had a lot of old school Reese's into this track. Um, Once again, that's recorded from my Juno DI. Um, it's always good to work um, as much away from my computer as possible because I feel like um, the hands-on process of the studio is lost, obviously, because not everyone can afford outboard gear, I understand, but it's, it's a whole new process. When you, instead of just doing this all day, you can, you can just step off and you can just play. You can just play on the keyboard and it's and it's more fun and it's more hands-on and uh, it gives you more of a studio experience if that makes sense. So I like to use this as much as possible if I want to try and get um, a cool sound out of it. I'll find a synth on here and, uh, and I'll play with the sound and then you know just rec record it in and then I know even though you know someone else might not know, I know from my own pride I guess that I put enough effort in to I actually physically played this stuff. Um, didn't actually quantize it. Um, again more of that live sound from the keyboard. So basically in Cubase they have the uh, an LFO feature called Tropper. Um, you can use it stereo so it goes side to side like a panner or you can use it mono which sounds again just like an LFO. So I've got a very gentle So that's what it's doing essentially if you put it on full mix. I've got it very gently doing it, so it just sounds like it's opening up the reese a little bit. Yeah, yeah, just underneath. You can just hear it opening up a little bit. I didn't want it to be um, overtaking the mix like that. Because I think it would sound unnatural with it. Yeah, it just, it just doesn't sound right, so I just wanted to have it a little bit of an open up there. And then I've spread it. As you can hear, it's really wide. There's a, there's a really amazing width to it. Again, that's the, the beauty of Dimension Expanded by Xfer. Um, amazing plugin. Don't use it too heavily because you can put it in that image limbo if that makes sense. Um, as soon as you start doing that again, it, it comes out of the mix. So, but for this, it was okay. As you can hear, it's not quite not very wide at all. Um, that's with all the inserts turned off. Um, so basically just wanted to accentuate the width of it, just to bring out that atmosphere into the, from the intro. So as you hear, I'll turn up the drone width. You can just hear it spreading as it comes through. Um, yeah, so just wanted that atmosphere, it's all part of the atmosphere again. So as you can hear on my EQ here, I've basically boosted a lot of the low mids because I want it to be very warm. Reese's are generally, as a rule, in my mind, I guess, um, shouldn't really be that present around here. You can always do um, the trick of maybe removing about 250, between 250 hertz and 500 hertz, which gives it that very scooped sound, which is uh, you know, a very good technique for cleaning up bases if you want to give it that very tight sound, like you get in the MV. I decided to keep this one in there because it's part of the intro, it doesn't need to be dipped yet. There's a 5 dB boost around the, the 2,500 mark, spread quite thick as well with the Q. And you can hear that's just where a lot of the shh is, and you want to bring that out. A Reese is very low midi and very shh and very sizzly. That's where that's the main sound of a Reese, so I wanted to bring that out a little bit more. Um, 
Same again with the tops, really. It didn't go too far up, 7K onwards. And then it rolls off from about, it rolls off about 18K. So it's, you know, 18K is quite high, but it's not ear ripping. <coughs> but as you can see on the analyzer here, there's really not anything clarity wise in the very top ripping at all. So, you know, you can quite safely boost that. And the same again with the, with the reverb. Just adds a little bit more reverb to the already um, very clean reverb, which is uh, natural on the patch that I used for the Juno DI. You can see it just adds a little bit more to it, just gives it that little bit more atmosphere. Didn't want it to be too intense because it's, it's a very short um, four bar loop. So. Very warm, very present just sort of sets the tone as it's coming in, as the intro's uh, progressing. So again, I was searching for more references for destruction and annihilation, because that's, that's obviously the theme I'm going for with this, with this remix. So if I turn these inserts. We may be witnessing the beginning of an era that will mean the complete annihilation so you can hear again, all atmospheric stuff, all atmospheric stuff here. We may be witnessing the beginning of an era that will mean the complete annihilation. So here, I basically removed all the rumble, a lot of the low mids, because I didn't want low mids to um, inflict, conflict with the, uh, the Reese's and a lot of the low mid, low mid tones that I've got playing at the same time. So I removed a lot of that, maybe warmed it up a little bit here, and then just basically I've got a 12 dB boost on the clarity of that because it's a very flat sample. We may be witnessing the beginning of an era that will mean the complete annihilation. It just gives it a very nice airy feeling. It's not too extreme. Um, I just wanted to give you know a nice bit of clarity so it passes through a bit nicer. We may be witnessing the beginning of an era that will mean the complete annihilation. So as you see, there's a low mid tone from the Reese. So I don't really need to go. So I don't really need to go um, boosting up the the warmth of the vocal. So I just wanted that to sit there. So another trick I like to do is I use Carehus Audio, um, their classic chorus plugin, which uh, uh, Taxman uh, guy signed and plays. He showed me how to use it. Um, really, really good. Um, really good for spreading actually with keeping the mono. Um, I wouldn't tend to use it if I'm just want to, if I want to spread something. I wouldn't tend to use it. But as a as a chorus, it's really good. But it does a really, really nice spread too. You may be witnessing the beginning of an era that will mean the. So as you can hear in that, and as I. I push my head forward because obviously the, the image of the speaker is going beyond my head, so I can hear the image better. So I'll do this. You may be witnessing the beginning of an era that will mean the complete enough. And you'll generally, because of the, uh, the way the speakers are pointed and how they're directional, you'll hear the image a little bit better the, the further they are pointing away from your ears. That's a technique I like to do. I don't know if it's right or wrong. Who knows? <laughs> you may be witnessing the beginning of an era that will mean the And as you can hear, it's, it's an extremely mono um, uh, sample. Um, which I didn't want. I wanted it to be spread with the rest of the atmosphere. So, maybe may witnessing the beginning of an era that will mean the complete annihilation. As you can hear, that really spreads it very naturally. It'll keep the mono signal there. The chorus just makes it a bit tighter and gives it a nice, a nice uh, smooth sound to it. So, on top of the classic chorus, there I've got uh, again Cubase's stereo enhancer. Amazing plugin. I love to use it all the time. Default plugin. So you'll get it with Cubase. Um, the original default setting is 100. That doesn't spread anything, actually, as far as I know. Um, so I've just given it an extra 49 on top of that. You may be witnessing the beginning of an era that will mean the complete annihilation. Just, just puts it a little bit wider. Didn't want to spread it too far. We'll see that image limbo again. Um, you may be witnessing the beginning of an era that will mean the complete annihilation. Again, it's more of an OCD thing when it comes to producing. I know how I want it to sound. I spread the whips. It's all pre personal preference. I could have stopped on the chorus. I wanted to send it a little bit further. So I wanted to delay out the uh, the vocal. You may be witnessing the beginning of an era that will mean the complete annihilation. And instead of automating in and turning off the bypass, turning it back on onto the same channel, I just copy the channel over. You can do duplicate tracks right here. And it will basically copy every single set in and be the same thing, but it will add a D in brackets there, which means duplicate. I've renamed it for delay, just so I know what it is. Same thing again, it's just all the same EQ settings as the last one, but I've added an H delay from Waves at the end of it, 
my favourite uh, delay plugin by far. <clears throat> annihilation of man, of man, of man. And to make it sound natural, it's crossed over. I've crossed this over myself actually by uh, fading it in, in and out from each one. So instead of it being directly on the edge of the of the sample where it might sound like it's clipped or if it has a little break, I always tend to just overlap each one and just have it fade out on, and fade in on the other one, just so it sounds a bit more natural. Um, you can do that by clicking on it and then you'll see a little thing up here and you can just do that. So I've added H delay on this and I've automated the feedback on it. <coughs> if you turn the feedback off, um, it's just personal preference just to keep it clean and then it turns it on and then just I've automated it so that it's a very extreme delay. If I leave that delay on there, it will probably start ringing a harmonic throughout the um, throughout the track constantly if you've got the feedback high enough. I probably have got the feedback high enough, so I've basically made it so it dips down in the amount of feedback. So it'll do a long feedback and then eventually just gradually go down because I don't want it to go throughout the track. And then I've just I remove it. They're right there, just before the drop. The annihilation of man. So you can see it's feedback there. <clears throat> Generally, as a rule for myself, about 92 on the feedback, as long as the dry and wet is on midnight right here at 50. As a rule, if you go above, say, 90, it will probably do the harmonic ring. It will <whistles> instead of actually delaying the sample itself, it will be delaying a harmonic. Um, so if you're going to do anything like that, try and either not breach 90 or do what I did, which is just automate out. The annihilation of man, of man, of man, of man, of man. Also, another trick is uh, if you use H delay, there's a button here called analog. And as a default, it's on two. Um, that is to give the effect of it being a hardware uh, delay and gives a hiss underneath, which is what hardware delays would do. I'm not actually entirely sure why you'd want that, because if you have lots of these on and they're all on two, eventually you start having a hiss right here, as you can see, and that just adds, and that just doubles up and doubles up and doubles up the more H delays you have. So I would probably have a setting where you turn it off so there's no hiss whatsoever, and as you can see, it disappears right there. Um, I've got the high pass filter here turned up to 400 hertz. That means it's only delaying up to 400 hertz upwards. Um, otherwise it's delaying rumble or anything low in that. So it will just basically just um, sound cleaner as a sample. The annihilation of man, of man, of man, as you can hear, man, it just keeps that low in it. So you, I just, you just listen to it as it goes along. The annihilation of man, of man, of man, of man, of man. The annihilation of man, of man, of man. As you can hear, it's getting rid of that low mid. The annihilation of man, of man, of man. Of man. I think about there, about 400. Probably sounds the best. And it just fizzles out. Oh, yeah. So to transition from that into the next part, which is the stems from um, the original, I've played live cymbals. Basically just playing two cymbals, like lot soft or hard. Just a general effect, really. You can do that as a drummer, as a percussionist, as, a, as an, orc an orchestra uh, drummer. And then just added reverb, EQ, stereo enhancer, the same as I've done for the previous, really. It sounds very natural. Just adds a nice, a nice effect into the track, really, just to transition it again. Transitions are very important. Otherwise, it sounds like it's doing a section, another section, another section. You want to merge those sections together by doing transitions, effects, symbols, anything. And then right here I've got the original samples of the stems from two different ops. The McMash clan actually gave me these. Um, obviously they were part of the stems, so but you can hear what they do. A nice high up and a nice low up. Obviously one for clarity, one for low, it just sounds good together. So for the highs, to make them a bit more tamed, um, instead of peaking or anything like that, I had a classic chorus to them, so it, it you know, sends the, the high, essentially you want more of the highs to be in the widths rather than the lows. The low, low, low uh, width is okay. Don't do anything below, hmm. I'd say don't do anything below 200 hertz in the width. Otherwise it will sound very, um, 
Oh yeah, again, image limbo. It will sound very unnatural. So, um, again, right there, the, that's, the, um, that's the dry effect right there. That's as wet as possible. So I've had it just uh, about a quarter of the way through. As you can hear, just again, it's all atmospheric. It all just makes it sound very nice, very, weird, very wide. And again, Stereo Enhancer doing the same thing, just sending it off a bit further. So within this intro, they've got a sub underneath in the stems. Now the problem with this stem is that they've got a little bit of a pop in the, in the sub. So a trick for myself is to uh, just pass that down basically. As you can see there, right there is where the pop is. But if I go any further, I might start dipping into when it when the note gets higher, it moves up here. If I go too far, you might start removing some of the um, original sound of it. So to get rid of the original pops from the from the sub, we just pass it up to about 200 hertz. You can still hear it, but in in a in a mix, you won't hear it essentially. Um, you can hear it a lot more like that. So you want to minimise that as much as possible. So I'll take it back to about 200 hertz and then give it a nice roll off. Again, with the theme of the live drums, <coughs> I put my own, uh, me playing uh, the rides in, but this time um, I've snapped and quantized the ride because that's a mixing technique. A DJ live, if he's trying to mix, let's say from if he's trying to mix the track from this section and he wants to match it to the rides, having a live rides won't help because he'll be trying to match that to um, the other track in the mix and it'll be going out and in and out. So something like a hi-hat or a cymbal, you really do want to, um, you know, just for the benefit of the DJs because you do have to concentrate on DJs when you do a lot of mixes. <coughs> just quantize the, the ride hits. So as you can hear, a lot, it's a lot of um, a lot of different types of types of hits of the of the ride in there. So it does sound natural, but it's actually snapped to the quantize so that it's on a grid, so that it's actually mixable. So so here I've got um, a Transex Multi from Waves. This uh, at the moment is only really dipping the transients from the very top because that's where the initial hit of the um, of the ride is going to be. It's going to be. T -t 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 -t. So right there, the initial snap of where you, when you hit the cymbal is going to be tss, tss. So I wanted to control that uh, just at the tops, as you can hear. Makes it sound a bit more natural. It also brings up a lot of the a lot of the presence from the uh, from the ride itself. And that's what I've done here with the compressor. Basically, just giving it a very, very, very gentle. Um, bit of compression just to control the whole thing no peaks are coming in and it will basically just bring up a lot of the a lot more of the quieter parts of the of the ride just bring it up a little bit so it sounds a lot more together so the EQ is again method of madness this is all preference depending on how what you want it to sound like if you want to get rid of any uh, renegade frequencies as I call it if you have anything popping out um, you should probably get rid of it just to make it sound cleaner as you can see down here, there's a lot of rumble from the very bottoms. That's at about that's at about 90 hertz. So I don't really want that. I'm going to um, pass this up to about 150 hertz. And you can hear there. That's the initial low rumble. Well, low mid. Sorry, low mid presence. I didn't really want that. I don't like. I don't like that kind of. I want it to be clean and sizzly. I don't want it to be um, very very flat if that makes sense. I don't want it to be very flat in the mix. It's going to go it sounds like it's going Hoo! in the mix so I kind of wanted to get rid of that. I like to call that a low mid ring. Just cleans it up a little bit makes it very nice. Same with the mids there. A very shh harmonic in there. I didn't want that again so I just removed that out. Just a 4 dB um, takeout, but again, that's that's preferential, 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 preferential. <laughs> um, 
So I boosted the mids here at 5,000 hertz. So I wanted to bring this up a little bit. As you can see on the analyzer, I use, I use the analyzer a lot. You can do it by ear as well. As you can see on the analyzer, it's very, there's a bit of a dip around that area. It goes up and it should go up as a sort of, as a sort of flat. Um, let's say if there was a line there, it should, they should all follow pattern of the line. So right now it kind of goes up, has a little dip and then goes back up again. So I wanted to just make that a bit more flat in the mix. It's not an essential thing to do. Um, I think it's a good way of, um, you know, cleanly having the whole thing across all spectrums of the EQ. Sounds a bit nicer. And then just, uh, I've noticed there's a bit of a, a, a very high ring in the uh, clarity of the, of the ride itself. So basically just remove that, uh, 3 dB, 3.5 dB. Again, you can just do the whole listening thing with South Filter where you just, and you can just hear there's a very, very high, very high uh, ring in there. You don't want that, obviously. So the more you cut out, obviously the cleaner it will be. So I myself, I like to work with a lot of effects. Um, again, it's all about uh, your transitions when it comes to section after section. For this bit here, I've got uh, a crazy Reese coming in, but obviously to gear you up for what's about to happen, just a cheeky build up. Um, not vengeance, crazy. <laughs> So I believe, I think I bounced out the audio for this and I've called it Reese. Um, so there's a, there's a sample pack uh, with Reese's in it, which I found and I've basically just tweaked that myself and then bounced it out. Um, I put it through contact, um, automated the, uh, the way it moves with the pitch shift and all that sort of stuff. So for this, uh, for this crazy Reese here, I've added a maximizer, which is uh, built into Cubase again. Very simple, just two knobs, just output for, for the volume, and it optimizes it, which I guess is obviously you know maximizing it. The more you optimize it, the more it maximizes. And that's that right there is what is telling you how much it's it's uh, optimizing it. Very simple piece of kit. Probably some presets you can work with. Um, just play around with it. It's nothing too complicated. Two buttons is you know just play around with it really. Again, I've enhanced the width of it. This good analyzer here, actually, uh, in Cubase's stereo, uh, stereo enhancer, is really good to test and see how far it's going. Again, as a rule, I probably wouldn't go as far as it, it can go, which is the edge, the very edge of that box. I would probably just keep it within. So as you can see, you can go up to that. That's the very first thing you can go. I don't really want it to do that, I want it to just spread and just stay around near the edges at the very best. So the original sample of this is a uh, is very void of a lot of the sub, but it, because it plays on its own, I want it to be very it has to cover all bases in in the in the uh, in the EQ, so I needed to build up the, I need to raise the sub of it with around 50 hertz. As you can hear there, um, it's a very strong 9 dB boost um, because it was lacking a lot of it. So, uh, you know, just to make up for that, I had to boost it that much. And uh, again, like I said earlier, as the rule from Reese is very, uh, very mid present. So, here I've done a, a, a little um, 2.5 dB boost. And again, that tsh of, the, uh, of the EQ is really good for um, bringing out the, the aggression of the distortion, as it were, for, for the Reese. So. And you can just hear it as you listen to that part. You can still hear it within the mix, so you can, you know, you can test how much you need to boost it or remove. And then I've done a second EQ, because um, I wanted to do a lot of spread, lazy EQing, I like to call it, because it's very spread. 
doing all the work for you. Um, so I boosted the low mids. One of my secrets, if I'm going to give it away, is uh, <coughs> concentrate a lot on, if you want a bit of warmth in your track, concentrate on around, around the 120, 150 hertz mark. Because that's a, a void between the kick and the snare, where a lot of the low mid harmonics actually are. So you'll hear that. It's not sub, it's not, it's not conflicting with the kick or the snare. It's just that void in between. So you can actually concentrate and work around and boost a lot of those mids there, um, those low mids, because you can, you can just add a low harmonic to it and it just makes everything sound warmer and nicer, to it, nicer in the mix, really. Again, I've done a, a lazy um, a boost up here on the, on the clarity of it. As you can hear from listening to the, to the range itself, there's nothing that's ripping your ears apart when you, when you listen to it. And it's just the same again. I just wanted a nice flat EQ. Apart from that mid boost there, we are white. So that's again that's the attack of the uh, the distortion from the Reese. So following the crazy Reese I did there, um, I, I made a bass just before the, uh, the 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 build up came in. So uh, I turned to my friend here, um, the Korg M MS20, I believe it's called. Um, uh, it's a very hands-on. It's it, there's no digital software to link up to it. It's all completely. Um, audio out. There's no way I can play with it. Like the, like my virus here, for instance, I can I can uh, play with the software and make bases all on that. I had to. You have to be very hands-on and literally just make everything all on this thing here. So my plan for that would be to make a brand new audio channel, uh, add a track audio, and then run it in, run it into mono because it's a mono only um, output. So I'd run that into mono, <coughs> and then I just press record, which you on Cubase it's just star. You press record. And then I just mess around uh, trying to make noises and, you know, for the next 10 minutes. And then as soon as I know I've heard a good noise, I'll stop the recording, cut it out, move into another channel and then um, go back to recording, still keep doing it. So I made a noise, which uh, unfortunately I've only bounced out here. Um, all the channels itself, all the inserts and everything is all bounced out into um, audio just for the benefit of my processor. So um, <clears throat> all I did basically, it was just a simple whoom noise. Um, which is just me, you know, holding a note and then just doing the, the pass filter and just making that noise and then just distorting the hell out of it, basically using Camel Crusher. Um, <coughs> I think I used two Camel Crushers, both on uh, the Annihilate setting and then playing with the tube and the mech um, and just a bit of uh, EQing here and there to make it cleaner. Uh, and it sounds like this. So as you can hear, it's purely mono. Um, <coughs> I have tried a few spray techniques, but it kind of makes it a bit weird. Um, it phases the mono a lot. Because it's completely mono, anything making it mono to stereo kind of um, makes it sound a bit strange because it delays the signal to, to pan left and right. So it doesn't really sound as clean as I wanted. So I, I decided to elect to have it completely mono. But then <coughs> having it completely mono to then having all the effects and everything exp um, you know, all the booms and everything next, the impact. <laughs> that all comes from the whips, so that actually gives it more of an effective impact um, after the noise happens. So you've got the mono and then all of the impact at once. So it kind of gives it that more of an explosive feeling when it comes in. Um, for the impacts, it's just a, a cinematic boom. I think it might be the same one I used earlier. Yeah. <coughs> um, Another effect of a downshifting bit crush, again, just EQ'd a lot of the lows out of it and some of the presence in the mids. It's an already, already made sample, so uh, yeah, lazy me. <coughs> so again, following the destructive, annihilating sort of uh, atmosphere of the track, I've put in uh, a narrative vocal. <coughs> Again, it's just you know, it's just a good sample to you know create atmosphere of that of that destructive uh, feeling of what I'm you know how the track goes when it drops. It's destructive, you know. Everything's getting annihilated by this track, and that's the th you know the theme again. I like to um, follow through with. So for this, I've used uh, Fabfilter Pro C, a uh, nice compressor. <coughs> I use Pro C too now, but for, for when I made this track, I was using Pro C. Um, <coughs> so for the settings here, I've basically got it so it's just controlling the whole the whole range of it, just to uh, you know, just to make it sound 
so it's not peaking, so it's not going. So it just you know it just brings it all together, makes it sound um, you know it's a lot more clean, I guess. And as, and as you can see there, it's controlling it about six to ten dB. So it's just you know any peaks will be squashed, and it'll if you were to you know if I was to balance this out, it'd be more squashed, and there wouldn't be these crazy peaks here and there, um, just so it sounds more together, as I say. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so for <laughs> so for the EQing, I've obviously gone a bit mental because it's um, a lo-fi sample that I've probably found on YouTube or something. So like, like the other stuff, I've just got rid of the rumble from from the sample of it because it's a movie sample, so there's a lot of effects underneath. I've tried to warm it up in the presence there of the low mids, and then just you know a couple of presence boosts, chopped out a harmonic in the middle, and just made it more you know a bit more clarity to the sound. Uh, just so it sounds a bit more cleaner, really, and it sounds like this. It sounds a bit more clean, really. I didn't really like how it sounded before. So just to, again, just to, uh, as one of my favourite effects, classic chorus again, just to make the whole thing sound a bit more um, as a clean sample, and, you know, just to give it a nice effect, really. Uh, classic chorus. That <laughs> classic chorus by Carehouse Audio. Um, yeah, again. It gave it that spread once again, just as uh, just as I like to have it for the atmospheric um, atmosphere. So this uh, this section here for the build up, I've got many effects build ups, all very standard stuff that you get from sample packs. But uh, it's always fun to make your own, uh, just for the part of the effect. For this one, um, this is a stem actually that uh, the McMashlane gave me, and I've just cut up and tried to make it my own uh, build up really. And as you can hear, it's just. It's building up with a sound, sh sound shift to pitch stereo from Waves again. On its own, it's just one note, I think. Yeah, so it's just doing that, basically. So I've got it doing um, a 24 semitone uh, pitch from bottom to top, uh, which is two, two octaves. Um, <coughs> just gives a nice, a long, um, a long build-up effect, really. Um, it's just good to have your own one. And then again, same with the width. I want it to be very spread to give the effect of... Uh, having its own uh, space within the mix, really. So to accompany all the all of the risers I've uh, got in there, effects risers and, and all the synth ones I've made myself, I've got um, a building kick and a building snare in there. For the kick, it's a very simple thing. <coughs> kick uh, build up kicks are just very simple. You just put them on you know, every now and again. So this one's just so that's just building up from a low pass going up into its original um, sound, and then it's high passing at the end of it. Like so. That just, uh, just for the sound of it, just before it goes into the drop, you don't want the kick going constantly and just stopping. It's got a sound natural to the to the track. So for it to merge into everything else, all the layers, you just um, you just high pass it basically. And then for the uh, for the snares layer was basically um, these are the stems, part of the stems they sent me, but I cut them up to make my own um, riffs. So this is the first one. And again, this is also building up from the DJM filter. So I've chopped them up into, into triplet snares there. Just, you know, just as a, as a pattern that sounds pretty cool for the build up. There's no, every, no really reason. It was just the idea I had and I just applied it to the track. So for this build up, again, we've got the sound, sh sound shifter um, doing the same thing, going up by an octave. So I've got Cubase as the tube on this. Um, basically the drive, um, is to apply the amount of uh, tube effect onto onto the snare itself. It doesn't really do too much um, to the sound of it. It pretty much just warms it up, uh, gives it a cheeky little bit of soft distortion, uh, much like a tube hardware would do. Um, so I've just got that uh, only 25% on the mix, so it just gives it a little bit more um, of an effect of that to it. And then I've got <coughs> and then I've got the output rising, um, so I can affect the amount of volume that's actually happening when. Uh, it's automating with the rest of the things like the G DJM filter um, because when the resonance is uh, high on the DJM filter, it will raise the volume of, of, the, of, the, of the hits. So you need to control that within the uh, automation. And as you can see, it's slowly building up there. <coughs> and then gradually it'll just get bigger and bigger in volume. And then as it merges out, it just fade it out with the output. Again, same with the kick, so when they play together. 
as you can see, so they disappear into the mix just before the drop. So accompanying the, uh, the rest of the, um, the layers, like the kick, the snare, all building up, all the effects and all the synth build-ups, I've got this Eamon, which I've included, which is actually um, from Simon Baseline Smith pack again. I've uh, got to give a shout out to those guys. I really love their sample pack. I only use their stuff occasionally, but it really helps. Um, so I've got this Eamon, which on the original, I believe, builds up itself. So I've basically just chopped that up <coughs> and made it do this. And then uh, once again, sound shifter, really good for automating the uh, the pitch on it, very cleanly actually. Also, again, just to uh, just to accentuate the build up of this of this track, um, I brought in my basses, um, high passing down, and that's the bass you're about to hear and find out how I made. Basically, the same again, DJM filter, stereo enhancer for the width, and then just. Um, yeah, just EQ all the bottom out of it, make it cleaner. Any ringing, same as usual. And it goes down like this, <coughs> and back up again as it builds up big time, and then like that. Pretty standard build up stuff, really. You can just about hear it. One of my one of my techniques for when I'm doing remixes is I, I really want to keep the original vibe of the of the track, so I'll, I'll keep a lot of the stems from the tracks because um, you know the most recognisable stuff from the remix is what you're gonna you know that lens and you'll pinpoint that and go oh it's that remix even if you if you've heard like one second of it if you hear you know it's from the original so you want I wanted to keep that um, so I put that in just before the drop just a cheeky little uh, layer of that out and then. <laughs> Layers galore. And again, follow again with the, uh, with the annihilation theme that I've mentioned so many times. Uh, yeah, just a woman saying annihilation. <laughs> Very simple. Annihilation. Again, just more EQing. Um, those are the harmonics I wanted to get rid of. This is all, all the clarity and get rid of the bottoms. <clears throat> again, with the classic chorus. Annihilation. Annihilation. Just gives it a nice spread, makes it sound more together, and again, stereo enhance the width of that. And then, uh, as a weird, as a weird effects layer before the drop, I put this thing in, which is uh, one of my old bases, I believe. I've got a sample pack of bases I, I come to that I used to make in Reason. Um, this looks like quite a long one, and the original element sounds like this. Pretty weird. <laughs> Not really much you could use that as a bass. For some reason I've drawn for it and uh, I've decided to turn that into a weird effects noise. So just snap this down to that. So that's the original layer. Again, EQ the bottoms out, made it more clarity. Again, for the width, the width spread to make it sound more together. A very, very wet um, classic chorus on that. And then I've drawn for my old friend, Effect Strix, but this is just to make the stuttering uh, sound for it, so it does this. It just sounds kind of cool before the drop, really, and it kind of sounds like this. So just like that. Alright, well that's all we've got time for part one. Uh, we're going to carry on with this mental remix in part two.